Sanbonanonke, Igama, and Duzo or Macatini, a Gumzali O Piano, a Nomundo Seven Zisa, O Piano, Pula, a Matambo, a Sugar Corner, a South Africa. Music to me is a lot of things. Uh, music is a way of knowing, it's a way of uh, viewing the world, um, it's a way of dancing with the world, it's, um, it's a way of finding synchronicity with both our calling on this world and uh, the encounters that we have with other people. Uh, that is why music is always underpinned with this notion of a collective, it's always underpinned with the idea of a gathering. Uh, that is one level. Another level is that music uh, is a place that connects us to unseen worlds that otherwise are difficult to perceive with the naked eye. And uh, so when we play the music, we invoke these other worlds upon which we enter. And within these worlds, there are uh, things that are necessities for humanity, such as hope, uh, such as joy and many, many, many other things. And finally, music is an aesthetic paradigm. It's a thing that carries within itself um, some kind of beauty. Well, um, I was born in a very musical family. Um, but not only my family, but the village where I grew up was a, a village of music. Uh, where people would sing all day and uh, there were gatherings and ritual ceremonies and of course each and every ritual ceremony had its own repertoire to signify the intention of a ritual. So inside my home my mother uh, was a singer, well she still is, uh, her name is Noma Jerusalem and uh, she had a piano that she didn't allow us to play. My dad was a guitarist, Smusiso. He's late now, but uh, he was an incredible musician. Uh, so this one afternoon, I found the piano uh, not locked and um, I started to play. And I got into the habit of sometimes hiding the keys, making sure it's not locked and play when no one was at home. Uh, it is this one uh, festive season where the family was there and I just stood there and played and uh, everyone was amazed how I had learned but of course I was watching my mother play a lot and I would stand behind her back and look uh, and that's really how I started to play the piano and um, when I matriculated in year 2000 I decided well I wanted to study music formally and uh, that's when I did my undergraduate studies um, at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And yeah, this is the time where things really opened up. But there was also a difficulty of having done music in a kind of quote-unquote informal way, a very free way, a very um, intuitive way that was just based on uh, an understanding of spiritual worlds and how they come into sound. And now I came to this formal world where these relationships were not encouraged. So this uh, created a difficulty for, for my journey, but I got empowered with theoretical tools, uh, technical tools as an instrumentalist. But later when I did my postgraduate studies, I considered the language. How do we speak of this world that is peripheral, peripheral that people don't understand as a world of theorization? which becomes the informal. When I completed my undergrad studies in um, KwaZulu-Natal, I had an experience of playing with so many musicians who were, um, uh, well, students, fellow students in the department, and that included my wife, actually, who was a musician as well there. And we met and uh, we really got interested in exploring music together. But um, KwaZulu-Natal, at least Deben, is a very small city. Well, not so small, but 
there isn't a lot of musical activities. And in order for me to grow, I had to move into Johannesburg. Uh, both me and my wife, who were not married then, uh, the, moved to Johannesburg. And this is when the, my whole musical world opened up. And um, I, I was teaching as well, but also traveling. traveling. I started to tour with uh, musicians such as um, Zim Gawana, Busim Shongo, uh, and many other musicians uh, recorded with them. Uh, did a lot of music with uh, Huma Sigela, and people that were really important for this art form. And of course, I played with my, fee, my, my peers as well, uh, people that I came to Joburg around the same time with. Uh, so I started working with Huma Sigela um, many years ago and I had just come up to Joburg and uh, he showed interest in my playing and we did um, a lot of uh, musicals that you know, we're talking about the story of migrant labors, which is something that he was interested in, the story of South Africa. And, um, and each time I remember when I would come to Joburg, he would say, don't, don't come to Joburg and not visit my house. That should be your first of always. And uh, he had a cook that would cook uh, West African food uh, at his home. And every time I'm in Joburg, I was, to start at his home and we listen to music. Um, and then a couple of years uh, before he would pass, maybe many years, maybe like six years, he had a vision of starting a music school in South Africa that would act like a satellite uh, school for Berkeley College. And so he sent me out to Boston, Berkeley to study their program. The idea was to see what a South African version of such a program would be. And it would create these cross-Atlantic connections, which he had started back then uh, when he was at Manhattan School uh, and collaborating with Af African-American musicians. And um, so after that, I was working for another school, uh, University of uh, Forte. This is maybe the last times we made music together. He came and we recorded a lot of music that uh, you know we might release in the future because it's really beautiful and it features his trumpet in a profound way. But more than anything, I mean, he is the he is the example of someone who took seriously his history and encoded it in the music and created an awareness all around the world about what was going on in South Africa. And uh, he's an epitome for both like fusing of indigenous sounds, but also for modernity. I mean, he, on stage, he would dance like nobody. I mean, I remember I was playing in um, Lagos, uh, Nigeria, playing a festival together. And man, when he went on stage, like everyone knew every song. It was incredible. And the next day we went out to Lagos Airport together. And I always had to wait because everyone knew him. So I was walking with him, I had to wait, people greeting him. So it's beautiful to see how the power of music really, uh, you know, adds into this ambassadorship and you carry your history, your people with you. I mean, he's always remembered. And um, every now and again, if I get a chance, I play his music. So I mean, in, in the beginning, I, talk up, I talked about music and how it's a, it's a way of, of, of knowing. But there's something that happens in the music, which is the enunciation, the production of sound that comes from a body, but also the same destination, it reaches the ear and we start listening to it. Um, so I think this is a, 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 a thing that is a, kind of historic with our ancestors who were hunters and gatherers. And, uh, and of course, the way of being in the wilderness was a way of listening. And um, through listening, you could sense things that were dangerous, but also you could sense direction, you could. So we come from this history 
and it's encoded in our DNA that we are sound people. Uh, we follow sounds. And uh, so in my native language, we have one word for sensing and music. It's called uguzwa. Uguzwa means to hear, but it also means to feel and to sense. So the, the, this kind of wholeness around this idea of hearing and idea of feeling is really a thing that's encoded in the music, that through ways of hearing, we also formulate ways of understanding and knowing the world. So the ways in which we know that a child is born is that first scream, that cry, and, and it's a sound that enunciates existence. So if we think about that as an expression of aliveness and, and, a, and a way of saying that I can feel what's happening around me, it becomes a very uh, significant um, part of our being. And if you play jazz, I think jazz is more about hearing than about playing. You know, you have to, you have to hear. And in order to tap into improvisation, I mean, listening is, is the most profound idea. And um, many years ago, I recorded an album called Listening to the Ground. And Listening to the Ground was really presenting this idea of um, uh, the notions of the earth and vibrations on the soil as a way of listening to history. And this listening to history is a thing that is particularly challenged in, in Africa, given the colonial context. And, and through coloniality, a lot of things were eroded, erased histories. So histories are not explicit, they're not in books. So we listen to the soil as a way of sensing where our ancestors have walked. And in their footprints, they left all of these messages to us. And now through this technology of the ear, we are able to remember many, many things. So it's a thing that sits very strongly in my work. Uh, you know, I can name so many albums. There's another one called Letters from the Underworlds. It's, it speaks about when we are listening, what is the message, you know? So a letter is a metaphor for a voice of an ancestor that speaks from beneath the, uh, beneath the earth. Well, now that I, you know, I've spent the greater part of this conversation really um, painting a picture of the points of departure, um, the, the, the sound, as I had said earlier on, is a place. And within this place, there are these messages. And we tap into it to understand a broader idea of existence. But then it becomes a philosophical question. And if we think historically, uh, the first encounters of the colonizers with Africans, they deemed Africans to be people that operated outside of irrationality. And as a result, they did not have a philosophical or intellectual tradition. And uh, many years later, another anthropologist and philosopher named Temple, who came from Europe, uh, started to say, well, these people have a philosophy. And that philosophy is based on their idea of Bantu. So within Bantu, there is Ndu, and within Ndu, there is Ubuntu, which is a praxis of Ndu. So Ndu is really a, a philo praxis, a, a, a way of situating oneself within an idea of holism. So Ndu has four paradigms, Kintu, Hantu, Muntu, and Kuntu. And these paradigms in themselves is an invocation of environment, invocation of being, being with other people, invocation of time and space concepts, and invocation of aesthetic and beauty. So do operates in these four paradigms, but it makes a claim that these are intrinsically intertwined. So it means a way of being is a way of sensing and loving environment, a way of touching and feeling, but also a way of being is a way of being in a collective agreement with others. So we have a, a saying in my culture saying, umuntu, umuntu, ngabantu. 
Omuntu, a person. Gumuntu is a person. Gabantu in the context of other human, human beings. So in other words, in the Bantu people, we do not exist as individuals. So what qualifies your humanity is your connection to others. Without connection to others, we say, if a person does not have a connection to society, we say he's not a person or she's not a person. So this leads to a constant uh, realignment with others, which is, nece is necessary to produce your own humanity. So the, the individual can only exist in the context of others. But this expands, it questions the notions of time and space. It says you have to be sensitive to space, you have to be sensitive to around men, arounding in order for you to be a being. It doesn't end there, it says there are these intangible paradigms of beauty, of sound, of visuals. And these things complete your humanity. So being a Muntu is to be constantly in touch with the sound of the bears that we are hearing, to understand it as a lexicon, as a language that is keeping this world alive. Um, and later, of course, this informs the musicality there is a sense in which we live in a musical universe. You know, the arrangement of the cheese, uh, the explicitness of the rivers and how they flow into others. All of these things make up the Ndu philosophy. So I play my music situated in Ndu understanding and Ndu philopraxis, which makes my sound attentive to surrounding, to beauty, to love, to joy. You know, so this is a way that I, I come now to create my own uh, way of languaging jazz, perhaps which is not an obvious way in the United States, maybe. Uh, but this is a way of creating a lexicon that is based on my cultural nuance, is based on the Nguni people. And um, this, of course, has made me to think critically about this idea of divination or the throwing of the bones, which taps into ideas of improvisation and the worlds that are unseen. So in closing this idea of Ndu, I use the idea of divination as a way of suggesting that music is a way of giving language to unseen worlds. <laughs>